All right, everyone. Thank you for joining me today uh, to learn a little bit more about Uganda. And uh, we're going to step a bit beyond the primate safaris, which of course Uganda is so well known for. Uh, but of course, we will talk um, a lot about the gorillas. We can't avoid gorillas and, and chimpanzees when, when visiting Uganda. But we will take you on a tour around the uh, safari circuit in the country and, um, and delve a little bit deeper into some of the other safari activities that one can do while visiting the country. Uh, just so that I'm not uh, the complete voice of Oz for this whole uh, webinar, I'm just going to say hi to you here from Control Room here in Seattle. Uh, I'm Tad Bradley from the Cusini Collection, along with my partner, Sonia Bradley, um, who despite our common last name, we are not married, we're just business married. Um, Sonia Bradley and Gretchen Healy, my colleague um, in Denver, we are the Cusini Collection and we are the North American sales reps for Classic. So I'll go back to the voice of Oz and so you don't have to look at my mug of the whole webinar and focus on these beautiful images of Uganda. We're going to start off uh, just with a, a very quick geographic orientation and a few uh, bits of information on the destination. Um, Entebbe is the international airport which all of your clients will fly into. It's uh, just about 35 kilometers from Kampala which is the capital but we generally try to avoid Kampala at all costs. Um, traffic in this between the two um, cities can be horrendous, a two and a half hour drive just to go 30 Ks. And really most people that are visiting Uganda are spending only one night in Entebbe in on arrival, possibly a second night on departure. And there are three very um, fine properties in Entebbe, which we'll talk more about. So Kampala can generally be avoided. Uh, as far as getting there, uh, Qatar, Emirates, KLM, all great options coming from North America. Brussels also flies um, in from Europe, uh, coming from South Africa. Um, SAA flies in there as well as Kenya and now Ethiopian as well. If you're combining Uganda and Rwanda, KLM is a great option um, because they fly into Kigali as well um, and actually do it on, a, on the same route. So you're able to combine the two, makes it very simple. Um, visas are required for Americans and um, they say must be purchased in advance, which we'll, we'll say is 95% is true. Um, little secret, you can still generally get them on arrival, but we highly recommend guests um, purchase them in advance and it's a super easy e-visa system, very seamless um, and easy to do uh, for $50. Or if your guests are visiting uh, Kenya and Rwanda as well, they may purchase the East African visa. However, if they're combining Rwanda and Uganda, it's actually cheaper to do two separate visas because Rwanda's visa is only $30 on arrival. So 80 bucks versus 100. If they are visiting Kenya, then it is, um, it is about the same price because Kenya's visas are 50 or $51. So generally speaking, um, the, the single entry visa is fine for most guests. Yellow fever is uh, required. It doesn't necessarily checked, but uh, definitely something you want your guests to make certain they have. Uh, medical waivers are possible as well. And of course, you need a passport with um, six months of validity. A little bit about the weather and seasons. Um, Uganda is an equatorial country. It has a really pleasant climate generally year round um, based on the fact that it's that equatorial area. There are some high altitudes as well, generally high altitudes, so it doesn't get um, too hot during the, the peak of the, um, of the quote unquote summer season. Uh, December through February is a great time to visit. It's generally warm, dry, spring-like, um, great for gorilla trekking and not quite as busy. March and then April through May is when you do get some rains. Um, however, it's really never enough to wash out an, an entire day, but generally the trekking, especially for gorillas, can be a little bit wetter. That said, you know, Bwindi is a rainforest, so it's, uh, there's a chance of rain just about any day of the year, but uh, especially April and May, um, the, the trekking can be a bit muddier and more slippery. And then the peak season, June through October, it's the cooler season, dry, um, it's also when there are more visitors, but uh, generally speaking, the wildlife viewing is excellent because of the, you know, the lack of water um, or the, the less water, uh, especially in Queen Elizabeth National Park and Murchison Falls. 
And then November is the short rain, so very similar to Kenya and Tanzania in terms of climate. Um, you do get some rains in November, but uh, less so than you do in April and May, and uh, lots of uh, beginning of the migra migratory um, uh, bird species begin ar arriving from Eurasia. So again, trekking can be a little bit more muddy and slippery during this time of year. So why Uganda? Here we've, we've talked about going beyond the gorilla trekking and um, you know we've, we've talked I've talked mostly about that in terms of the safaris there but it really is one of Africa's most diverse and truly dynamic uh, countries and, and regions um, you can see the photo there of the Barunga volcanoes um, it's just spectacular vistas throughout the country and there's really a, a wide variety of activities beyond the gorillas and the chimps and beyond the the 13 different uh, diurnal primate species. Of course, gorillas and chimps are a must do, especially gorillas for those guests that are visiting Uganda. Certainly wouldn't advise against doing gorillas. Um, it's an, a once in a lifetime wildlife experience, but there is a lot more to do between all the amazing forest hikes for those active uh, folks. Of course, Murchison Falls um, up in the, the National Park up toward the north, incredible uh, natural wonder. Trekking through Bwindi again for active clients. And then there's great driving safaris. Murchison Falls National Park has um, just been improving um, year over year in terms of its, uh, its game, actually it's stable and it's not increasing elephant population. Um, we're seeing more and more leopards in Murchison as well as lions. And then of course the great um, Nile River, which draws lots of wildlife. And then Queen Elizabeth National Park has traditionally been the, um, the destination for safaris and it still is a very good safari destination again the big four there with uh, good big prides of lions and uh, herds of buffalo elephant uh, herds as well for active safari goers again beyond even the gorilla and chimp trekking you have walking safaris biking horseback riding safaris available in particular in lake umburo national park so a, a great option for those that want to get out of the safari vehicle and then We'll talk a lot about this as well. It really offers two of Africa's best boating or river safaris in the, in the continent, um, between the Nile in Murchison Falls National Park and the Kazinga Channel in Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and then it is an absolute must do at the top of every Twitcher's list. If you have birding clients, Uganda should be their next destination. Um, well over a thousand species of birds, uh, many endemics. The shoebill, of course, is a highly sought after species that you can see in, in uh, Murchison Falls National Park, as well as the Mabamba wetlands near Entebbe. Um, so it's an absolute must do for the birders on your list. And then some very unique cultural experiences between the Batwa, pygmies around Windy National Park, uh, the Karamajong and the Ik up in Kadepo in the far north. And then I like to say, oh, Uganda really is kind of like culture, um, by osmosis. Uh, it's a driving destination in general. So when you are um, driving between different uh, safari uh, destinations, you're going to be driving through small homesteads, farms, villages, and seeing lots of people. It is a fairly densely populated country with a lot of people around and people who are generally very happy to see visitors as well, which is really refreshing um, in East Africa, which sometimes isn't the case in destinations that have become, you know, that have had a more visitors over the years or have established their tourism industries far, um, you know, long ago. And so you really do absorb the, the, the culture, even if you're not having specific quote unquote cultural activities, just by driving through the area, stopping for uh, lunch um, and uh, having a short walk around a village with your guide. Uh, there's a lot of uh, real cultural um, uh, interest and, and just, you know, absorbing that culture as you're visiting and driving through the country. There's also fewer visitors, great game viewing, um, as I said, great cultural opportunities, and then a number of really nice accommodations. This is not a luxury safari destination for the most part, so that's just to keep that or, or set that expectation and, and definitely something for your visitors to, or for your guests to be aware of. You know, you don't have the level of luxury lodges in Uganda that you find in elsewhere in East Africa or Southern Africa, but some very nice properties, and we'll talk about those that Classic books and recommends. 
and uh, guiding here is top notch as well. And then we've got new flights that we'll also talk about from the Mara and the Serengeti, which make Uganda a much easier extension for guerrilla trekking than it used to be. Obviously, the $600 permits um, are also an, an attraction versus $1,500 in Rwanda. And that is, um, you know, $600 is guaranteed through the end of next year. Beyond that, we don't know, but uh, it certainly offers a great value compared to its, uh, its sister next door. All right, I don't really have to give you in the travel industry a um, geogra geography lesson, but you can see where Uganda is in East Africa. I'm gonna zoom in here and um, focus today on the, the safari circuit, which is um, starting here in Entebbe on Lake Victoria, up to Murchison Falls in the north, north central, and then down the Albertine Rift past Lake Albert into Kibale National Park, Queen Elizabeth National Park, and finally, Bwindi National Park. We will touch on briefly Lake Mburo, as I mentioned, great for active safari goers, uh, right down here. And then the far, far northeast of the country, Kadepo Valley National Park, which is um, certainly at the top of my list, but one that is challenging to get to due to logistics and, and cost. But we will touch on um, those as well. Outside of that, you do have um, rafting here in Jinja. We're not going to cover that, um, but much of the really the focus in, U in Uganda as far as safaris is really this uh, Western um, tourist trail here from Murchison Falls down to Windy. And that's where, we're, where we'll focus most of our time today. So classic Africa safaris, um, they're a ground operator based in Entebbe. They also operate in Rwanda. They were founded in 2001 by Mel Gormley and Phil Ward, who are longtime safari veterans in, in East Africa, having uh, traveled around the region um, as guides themselves for, for many, many years. And uh, they partnered up, you know, geez, how many years ago is that now? Uh, seven, uh, nearly 20 years ago. Um, they have a combined over 75 years of experience in the industry. So really well experienced guys in this part of, of Africa. They're a small hands-on company. Um, they uh, have a, uh, like I said, an office based in Entebbe with um, where their vehicles and their vehicle shop is based. And Uganda being a, a driving destination, again, for the most part, vehicles are really critical to the experience, good vehicles. And Classic really prides themselves on having the best vehicles in Uganda. You can see a, a photo there um, of some of their uh, stretch land cruisers. These are custom designed and built. Mel Gormley um, is, is a, is an incredible um, vehicle designer and builder himself. We have our own shop where we custom design our, all of our own vehicles to exacting specifications, and then obviously do all of our own maintenance as well. Each vehicle is thoroughly inspected after every safari uh, to make sure that it's in prime working condition. And then our guides um, are really a big part of the company as well. Um, we have a handful of on-staff guides and then a strong network of about a dozen freelancers as well who we work with. And again, in a driving destination, vehicles and guides are really critical to the guest experience. And that's where Classic puts a lot of their emphasis and time and, uh, and preparation is, is into those two factors. We're also a ground operator, tour operator. Um, we're not a property group, don't own any properties. So, I mean, I think that's of particular importance um, as we work with a wide variety of lodges and camps and don't really have any um, interest in, um, in, in sending guests to a specific property um, because we don't have to fill any bed nights. So we work with uh, a lot of, of the best properties in Uganda and we'll always design a safari that, uh, that fits um, your clients and their interest and budget. We're gonna talk also about some of the new flights here. So I just say that Uganda is a driving destination, but there are there is a network of flights as well that has made um, it easier to add in some of the farther flung destinations like Murchison Falls or Kadepo, um, and, and then much easier to do guerrilla extensions, you know, five nights, six day sort of extensions uh, on a Kenya or Tanzania safari. So Aerolink is part of uh, Air Kenya, um, it's a sister company of Air Kenya. And as you can see, they've got a nice uh, daily network of flights here based from Entebbe that, that ply this um, you know, Western safari circuits down to the Southern part of Windy, Northern Windy up to Queen Elizabeth. Um, we don't do much in Samaluki National Park, but then onward back to Entebbe. 
And then they do have some seasonal flights. Um, they're not daily, but some seasonal flights up to Murchison Falls and also to Kadepo National Park. Uh, you can see the flight schedule there. I'm not gonna go into the specifics, but um, they are, uh, as I said, down in, this, in, the, in the main safari circuit is daily flights, in some cases twice daily. I will send out this um, network or this uh, map as well as the schedule to all of the attendees so you can have that on file for you. What's exciting now is just last year, Auric Air started flying directly from the Serengeti into Entebbe, and coming in June of uh, 2019, next year, um, Air Kenya will now be flying directly from the Masai Mara. So we have uh, flights that will be connecting into that Aerolink network from the two um, gem safari parks in, in East Africa in the Serengeti and the Mara. And these are timed, of course, to connect with um, uh, Airlink, Airlink's flights to Bwindi. So now being able to add Uganda uh, to a Kenya or a Tanzania safari is much easier, um, especially if your guests are just looking to do gorillas. Um, it's, a, it's a much easier extension than it used to be. Um, Rwanda always was a lot easier because of the multitude of flights out of the Serengeti in particular, but now we have these, this option and, um, and it is very, uh, very seamless. So I'll send out this information as well, as well as some sample itineraries that you can take a look at from a five day gorilla extension up to a 12 night, um, 12 day uh, full Uganda circuit as well. So we're gonna start our virtual tour around Uganda in Entebbe, which is of course the gateway to Uganda. All flights will fly into Entebbe. Um, we have three properties that Classic recommends and books generally in Entebbe. The first is Car Karibu Guest House, which is about a 10-minute drive from the international airport. It's a lovely property. I think it has about 10 rooms. Uh, has a very homey feel, as you can see there. Wonderful lush gardens. They've just put in a swimming pool, I think, last year. So a little bit of luxury as well for um, washing off the, the hours on the international flights. Um, this is not a luxury property by any means. You can see the photo there, but it's very comfortable, great for a one night stay. They also have some of the best food in Uganda as well. On my last visit there, we, uh, we only were able to have breakfast, many of us, because of the late arrival. And we wish that we could have stayed to have uh, lunch or dinner because the food is just tremendous. So it's a really nice, um, very well-priced option for guests, um, especially those who like that kind of B&B &B guest house, um, homey, family run sort of sort of feel to it. Alternatively, you have the Protea, which is uh, about five minutes from the international airport, literally across the street from the exit gate, right on Lake Victoria, nice big pool there. And it's a traditional, you know, international hotel. It is a Protea. And for guests that uh, maybe are less comfortable with uh, the homey feel of Karibu, it's a, it's a fine option. A little bit more expensive than Karibu, but it does offer this, the convenience um, being right there at the airport and the fact that it's, it is a known quantity in, in being a, a Protea or now, you know, Marriott as well. So for those that have Marriott points as well, that's something to consider. And then just opened here a few months ago, hotel number five, which is really the, the only and the first and the only boutique hotel in Entebbe and um, getting nice reviews from this property. Um, a beautiful boutique collage, also only about 10 minutes from the airport. A great option for um, higher end luxury travelers who prefer the boutique um, feel, but don't necessarily want to do more of that guest house with, with Karibu. The price is, um, as you would expect, more Quite, quite a bit more, um, almost double the price of Karibu, um, but, uh, but is about on par with Protea as well. So keep that in mind. Um, it did just open in July, but like I said, from what we're hearing from guests, um, that people are really, really liking it. And uh, it's part of the Wild Frontiers group of properties as well. So they do a great job with their, with their properties uh, throughout Uganda. So heading out of Entebbe, which again, most guests are gonna spend a night at most in Entebbe on arrival. Uh, most of the flights arrive mid to late afternoon into the late evening. You have that first night. Um, classics guide as well as one of the representatives from the office um, in Entebbe will meet your guests at uh, whichever property they're at in Entebbe and do a whole briefing on the safari 
go through um, their itinerary, any questions that they have, give them their um, departure documents and their maps of, uh, of Uganda and the various destinations that they'll be visiting, some great maps that, that um, we give to our clients and can also send to you if you are in need. And, uh, and then they're off onto uh, their safari. So for those that are doing a longer trip and including Murchison Falls, Heading from Entebbe up to Murchison is about, uh, you know, it's really a full day's drive. So seven, eight hours, depending on uh, the number of stops along the way. Um, we generally will stop for lunch. And there is the uh, Ziwa Rhino Sanctuary in route, which is the only place in Uganda where you can see rhino. It's obviously not a wild um, uh, uh, sanctuary or wild park or wild rhinos, I should say. Um, but if guests really do want to tick that box and they haven't seen rhinos, that's something that we can arrange as well. It's a tarmac road all the way up to, um, you know, basically to the, the base of the park and then through the park it is um, a dirt road. I should mention, um, I think I may have just seen a question come up. If you have questions, um, just uh, put them into the Q&A or you can also um, put up a, a chat uh, as well. So uh, I will not stop during the middle of the, of the presentation. I'll go and answer all those questions at the end. So. Um, and if uh, anything is not answered, just feel free to give me an email or shoot me an email or give me a call and we can talk through it. So Murchison Falls up here, it is actually um, Uganda's oldest uh, national parks and it is its first national park um, uh, gazetted back in 1952. Uh, and of course it's most famous for uh, the Murchison Falls uh, itself, which is uh, an extraordinary, natural phenomenon, natural wonder. Um, it's an eight meter wide gorge where the, the entire Nile River squeezes into and creates this thunderous you know, airplane engine level um, roar as it, uh, as it falls into the Devil's Cauldron and into the lower Nile there below the, uh, below the falls and creates these incredible rainbows as well, pretty much permanently. It is the uh, very famous as the site of the 1951 film, The African Queen, starring Humphrey Bogart, which was filmed here and on Lake Albert um, as well. It is one of Africa's top birding destinations, 450 species of birds. You have the shoebill, of course, and you're, you're nearly guaranteed to see the shoebill here. Um, if you do have twitchers, the Mabamba wetlands in Entebbe is another shoebill destination and if you combine the Mabamba wetlands and Murchison Falls National Park um, you're again pretty much guaranteed to see the shoe bill so if you have um, birders just make sure that we're aware of that so we can design the itinerary to uh, to accommodate them but certainly Murchison Falls is a must do for birders good general game viewing and getting better there's big four here no rhino um, but uh, good Good herds and growing herds of elephants, buffalo, um, lion. You do see uh, leopard on occasion as well. Of course, as I, you see, the falls is, is one of the biggest attractions. And the Nile River itself, not only for the falls, but also for the Nile River Delta. Um, excellent boating safaris and, and really some of Africa's best. As I mentioned, uh, the shoebill and the birding in general is, is phenomenal. There's the, the shoebill, bizarre looking uh, bird in the upper right. Um, that's a photo I took when I was there last. So um, definitely, um, I'm not a twitcher, but uh, we, were, uh, we were determined to, to see a shoebill and we did see a couple when we were there. Ugandan cob in the lower right, of course, the national bird of Uganda as well. Boating safaris, as I mentioned, is a big feature and, and attraction of Murchison Falls, and you have two different trips. So the, the trip on the top goes to the um, uh, below the falls, below Murchison Falls. It goes upriver, up the Nile. And then there's a trip that goes downstream to the Nile Delta. And the uh, different types of boats, uh, as you can see, the, the one on the top is a, a shared uh, larger boat, which we generally will quote um, as a default and then you can upgrade your, your guests for not a whole lot of additional money for, uh, for a private boat, which is the smaller boat there in the, the, um, in the lower, the lower uh, photo. And uh, we do recommend, if you can, is, is to, to upgrade your guests to that uh, private, those private boats as well. It just does improve the experience. Um, but going to the base of the falls is, is an experience unto itself. Um, hearing the, the roar and the thunder of the water as it comes through that eight meter cleft is, uh, is spectacular. Also little known fact, it's right near the base of the falls is where Ernest Hemingway crashed his plane back in the, I think the 50s as well. Um, and <laughs> tried to fly it up again, get it off the ground and crashed a second time. 
and managed to survive both and then decided uh, stuff it, I'm going to uh, drive back to Camp Paula. He was with, I, I forget who, uh, one of his wives or girlfriends at the time, and I think uh, she said, enough, Ernest, let's drive. But there is a little plaque and marker where you can see where he crashed his plane. Along the Nile River, um, huge herds uh, or pods of, of hippos. You're going to see lots of elephants, as I mentioned. It's a good uh, thriving elephant population. And then, of course, some of Africa's biggest crocs um, that I've ever seen, just extraordinary uh, large crocodiles, and then primates, colobus monkeys, um, and then chances to see Ugandan cob, lots of plains game, as well as the, you know, the possibility of lion and uh, giraffes as well. There's a really strong population of, of Rothschild giraffes, which is uh, one of the highly endangered giraffe species. Previously, they were just on the northern bank of the Nile, um, but but now they have been translocated, ferried across the Nile uh, to the south bank as well, and actually then taken down to Lake Mburo National Park. So there's, a, there's enough of a population that the, that the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, which is active in this park, has actually translocated them outside of the park elsewhere in Uganda. A couple of uh, options that we recommend in, in Merchants and Falls National Park, Para Lodge is a an old government run lodge it's been up, upgraded but it's you know your classic traditional safari lodge larger um got a big pool and there are some units uh, rooms that have air conditioning to keep that in mind um, which can be good for families and it's up in its elevated position over the nile river so it has a really nice view um, toward the nile which is which is quite nice but it is your you know your larger safari lodge um, i think we generally prefer uh, for fits in particular Baker's Lodge, which is on the south bank of the Nile. Uh, Para is on the north bank. And, and I guess one advantage to Para being on the north bank is that the north bank of the Nile is where most of the safaris are done. It's where there's larger plains area um, where you have more wildlife. The south bank where Baker's is, is a little bit more forested. Um, they do have some safari tracks there and it's how you access the top of Merchants and Falls. But in general, the, the game isn't as strong on the south bank. So when you are staying at Baker's, you do need to ferry across the river, either with the public ferry or by private um, uh, launch or private boat across the river. Just one thing to keep in mind. Generally speaking, we recommend at least three nights at Mercis and Falls because you do have that long drive up. And then one day where you do the Nile Delta um, down to see the Shoebill and other game, and then on to the northern bank of the Nile for safari. And then the following day, do the, um, the base of the falls trip on, on the boat as well. So you really have two full days on the river. And then the following day, um, heading down to Kibali National Park for your chimps. So if you're driving, this is another, um, generally speaking, a full day's drive, six to seven hours down through Masindi and uh, toward Fort Portal. This uh, road has not been paved, although they are currently in the process of paving it. So hopefully within the next year or two, it will be fully tarmacked and that um, drive time will drop down you know, to four or five hours instead of six or seven hours. But it's still a beautiful drive. Um, as I mentioned, Uganda very heavily populated. So you're driving through small homesteads and villages farmlands and as you get closer and closer to Fort Portal you'll begin to see some of the tea estates as well. You can see the photo here these rolling verdant hills of of tea um, especially like I said close to Kibali um, with uh, with women walking along with uh, baskets full of goods in this case tea on uh, as they're as they're heading from the from the fields and just lots and lots of smiling faces which is what I love as I said Uganda still um, the welcome that your guests and you receive as a visitor is, is very genuine and heartfelt and warm. And, uh, and because you do see a lot of people, you will, uh, you'll get lots and lots of these smiles. So Kibali National Park, um, really the focus here is on chimp trekking in, in the national forest. Um, it's a very high success rate. There are other places to trek for chimps, actually Murches and Falls. There is a um, forest there, um, Budonga Forest, I believe, where you can chimp, uh, chimp trek as well. Um, and then in Chambura Gorge in Queen Elizabeth. But we really recommend um, guests uh, do it in Kibali, um, not only because of the success rate, but it just generally is, a, is an easier experience in many ways and a better experience. Um, Kibali is home to 13 primate species in addition, or uh, along with the chimps. 
you have the chimp habituation experience. So for primate nuts who really want to immerse themselves in a primate uh, daily life, doing the habituation experience is definitely worthwhile. And that is a full day from before the sun comes up into the park, uh, spending the day with the chimps as they wake up, as they go about their day, um, having lunch, picnic lunch in the park, and then staying with the chimps until they begin to make their nests for the evening. So it can be a long eight plus day experience. Uh, alternatively, you have a morning trek and an afternoon trek as well. So for guests that, that, uh, that want to do two treks, that's certainly doable in one day, um, but then they can go back to their lodge for lunch and not have to spend the entire day in the, in the, in the forest. And uh, those treks range from two, you know, from, well, less than an hour in some cases to two to three hours. So not as long as gorillas, generally speaking. And we like to do Kibale first before heading down to Buindi for a couple of reasons. And the, one of them is just that we're building up to a gorilla experience. So um, why start with that, um, unless it's just an extension. But if you're doing a longer safari, why start with the big, um, the, the big prize, the thing you were, you were coming to do, or the, uh, that's the, the highlight of the trip. Why start with that? Let's build up toward that. So from a story standpoint and experience standpoint, but also from a guest comfort standpoint and from a guide standpoint to understand how fit your guests are. So Kabali and the chimps is a great way as, as a warm up to gorilla trekking. So not only can your guests kind of gauge their level of fitness um, and get warmed up a little bit for their gorilla treks, but also our guides can have a look and just see, listen, if they're struggling with chimp trekking, they're going to really struggle with gorilla trekking. So we just need to make sure that they have a porter or potentially even recommend that they do a litter to get to uh, see the gorillas. So it's a, it's a, it's a couple of different reasons why we, we try to go that route and starting with Kabali first. And then there's some great cultural experience in particular, the lunch at Tinka's house, which I'll talk about here. Um, you also have the Bogoti wetland sanctuary. So outside of just bordering Kibale National Park is this community-based tourism project um, that is run by the local Bogoti community. And this is a, uh, a great addition to, um, to the, the chimps where you get to walk through a very beautiful forest, great for birders. You're not gonna see chimps in this area, but you'll, you will see other uh, primate species and including black and white colobus um, and other primates. And you're also then contributing to this community-based um, tourism project as well. And this is all operated by um, the Bogoti Tourism, uh, Community Tourism Association. And one of those other experiences um, that also benefits this association is lunch at John Tinka's house. And John is one of the founders of this association and a really prominent community leader. And he has opened up his house uh, also for overnights for generally more for backpacker level clients. But, um, but we like to support his association and his work through having taking our guests to have lunch at traditional Ugandan lunch um, at his home. And he, if he is there, which is often, um, he is a wonderful ambassador for Uganda, speaks very eloquently, has traveled around the world, um, been to the States on numerous occasions. So he really understands international guests, understands Americans, and can talk about um, his experiences and what this project means to the community. And honestly, we get feedback from guests that this is the best meal that they had on their entire trip. So um, uh, sanitary, it's extremely sanitary. They are very um, aware of that and make certain that the food is, um, is prepared in a sanitary way. And um, it really is a great uh, trial of, of traditional Ugandan East African food. You doing using Ugali and, and sitting on the floor and, and uh, just having a, a good cultural experience through food. Accommodation options in Uganda or in uh, Kibale. So there are three that Classic uh, prefers. Primate Safari Lodge is the only the only property that is right inside the park, so it has that convenience factor. It's recently been uh, renovated. There were safari tents that have now been transformed into these beautiful cottages, luxury cottages. There are two categories: luxury and and more moderate. Um, we uh, prefer to book just the luxury cottages and uh, really high level of accommodation. It is, uh, as I said, right at the park headquarters. So for convenience, especially for those guests that are doing the habituation experience or two treks, it's really nice to be located um, you know, steps from where they will begin their, their day and their treks. Um, 
the level of service and the food is, um, we get some mixed reviews here. I think it's improving. Um, and so we just keep an eye on that. But in general, this is a really, really great option. And again, offers that, uh, that convenience factor. A little farther afield, the other two options, Nadali Lodge, um, wonderful uh, family run, owner operated lodge. There's about eight of these cottages uh, located about 45 minutes away from the park. It's set on the ridge line overlooking the Renzori Mountains on one side and then a beautiful crater lake on the other side. So location, while not in the National Park, um, from an aesthetic standpoint, to have these beautiful views and a swimming pool that overlooks the Renzoris as well. And it has a real um, wonderful atmosphere. There is no electricity in the main lodge, as you can see here. So it's all candlelit at night. So a uh, real colonial feel to it as well. And fantastic food. Some of the best fish and chips I've had anywhere in the world actually was at this lodge, if you can believe it or not. Um, and it is owned by a British expat, so that's probably why. And um, the owners who are off on site um, almost all the time are wonderful, uh, um, uh, incredible hospital offer incredible hospitality and a really wonderful warm welcome to their guests so we love this property and again it does mean a 45 minute drive to the park but um, because of its location and its its um, owner operated warm welcome it's really a, a big favorite also about 45 minutes away is the um, Chaninga Lodge which is set in an equally spectacular spot up on the edge of a crater lake also overlooks a uh, the Renzori Mountains as well, um, and this is a this is a nine rooms of these different style than Nadali. This is a kind of log cabin feel to it, um, and um, if this is an, a lodge if you have guests that have mobility issues, um, it's not going to be your best bet because there's lots and lots of stairs to get here due to its location. But uh, because of its location on the top of that ridge, um, it does have these spectacular views, and this lodge um, offers a lot of other active um, activities beyond just the primates uh, and the chimps in Kibali. Um, of course, more than often than not, guests are only staying a couple of nights in Kibali. But if you do have guests that want to get more active, do some longer treks and walks, or they have a wonderful community project as well that the owners have started in um, Fort Portal that is benefits um, disabled Ugandan children which is obviously a, a real need in, in Uganda. And uh, there's opportunities to go and um, volunteer there or to at least visit and, and contribute some funds as well to help uh, that, the operation of that really worthy project. So both uh, Chaninga and Nadali are about the same price, um, a little bit more expensive than Primate. Um, and the food at, uh, at both is, is really exceptional. So now heading from Kibali down to Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is the most visited um, safari destination in Uganda, um, more so than Murchison Falls, just because it is a little bit more conveniently located. It is only about a you know three or four hour drive from Kibali down to Queen Elizabeth, and you're heading down in the Great Rift Valley and, and looking at the Renzori Mountains as you as you descend into Queen Elizabeth. So a stunning drive and, and like I said, a very short, you know, three, four hours at the most. And you, uh, Queen Elizabeth is actually where the equatorial line is, as you can see here on the map. So that's a must stop just for a quick, a quick photo. It is home to over 600 bird species. So again, for the birders, it is an absolute must visit. And in particular, it is about the Kazinga Channel, um, which is one of Africa's best boating safaris. Also, um, the Ashasha sector in the south of the park is m famous for its tree climbing lions. So for, for guests that want to see uh, lions up in, in fig trees, Ashasha is a, is a fantastic option. We'll talk about that as well. It really does, it offers this really diverse set of landscapes, but what is really striking to me and what I remember the most is being out in these open plains looking at elephants or lions and then behind you you have these uh, glacially topped Renzori Mountains. So it's, it's like taking big mountains and putting them on the Serengeti. Now certainly they're not, the plains aren't that big, but it does have that um, aesthetic quality to it that I, that I absolutely loved because of the, the mountains behind. Just to give you a little bit more, uh, because Queen Elizabeth is, is quite a, I, I won't say complex, but there's a lot going on here um, in the National Park. So here you're coming from 
uh, Kibali up here in the north, heading down this the highway through Kasese, which is um, actually where flights will land if you are have guests that are flying in here. Kasese is the where the airstrip is. That serves both Queen Elizabeth National Park as well as Kibali. But heading down this highway now, it, the Queen Elizabeth is actually bisected by a highway, which isn't certainly ideal, but it's the reality. There also are um, villages inside the national park that were grandfathered in prior to, um, that were there prior to the gazetting of the national park and they were allowed to remain. And then you have a village here right on the edge of the park where several of the accommodations are. And so it is not your most remote wildlife experience. So that's something just to, again, setting the right expectations. There are people, quite a few people around and even inside the park. Um, and so, and then you have this highway going through it. So one of the reasons why I really, you know, all things being equal, I, I prefer Murchison Park, uh, Murchison Falls National Park, if you can get your guests to take the time to go up there because it is a, a lot more of a, has more of a safari feel to it um, because there is, there just aren't the villages around and people around. But nonetheless, um, Queen Elizabeth is certainly um, an experience uh, to be had if you're in Uganda. And it really centers around the Kazinga Channel here. Like I said, one of Africa's great river safaris connecting Lake George with Lake Edward. Uh, Property-wise, um, the Mwea Lodge here, located on the Mwea Peninsula. It's a big traditional safari lodge, but it does have that location that is fantastic right on the Mwea Peninsula on the edge of the Kazinga Channel overlooking that and, and Lake Edward. And then the other properties that we generally recommend are here in Chimbura Village itself. We'll talk about those. And then down here in the south is Shasha, which is uh, where the tree climbing lions are. So a lot of your game viewing is gonna be here in the northern banks of the Kazinga Channel. Um, Kasenye is great, uh, the plains over here for lions um, and just general game. Um, heading down to Ashasha is a full day. So it's generally not something we would recommend as a day trip. Um, from if you're staying up here in the north just because of time it's a you spend most of your day traveling down here in this area um, in this forest is there's not a whole lot to see although I did see a leopard in a tree overhanging the road the last time I was there but um, but you really you don't see a ton uh, until you get into the Ashasha Plains in the south so if you guests do want to go to Ashasha it's good to spend a night down there um, to experience it properly and then head on to Bwindi and it happens to be on the way to Bwindi so it's very easy to add a night um, logistically to your safari. Kazinga Channel, it does boast some of Africa's largest hippo pods. I think I've heard it has the highest population of hippo, um, possibly in Africa with over 30,000 hippos. So you're not gonna want for hippos on this experience any time of year. Um, also big herds uh, or big pods of crocs, um, elephants, large buffalo herds, and great bird life as well, over 600 species of birds. Um, generally, this is an afternoon, a best in the afternoon, um, because of uh, as the heat of the day rises, you have more of the animals coming down to drink um, at the channel. Uh, and all of the cruises depart from the Moya Peninsula, and most of them are operated, if not all of them, by Moya Lodge. And uh, there are private as well as uh, shared cruises as well and we'll always break down the cost um, generally default to a shared cruise and then give you the additional charge for a private cruise. This is a shot from when I was there last, elephants coming down to drink. This is a classic Kazinga Channel image. Big buffalo herds as well um, heading down. The occasional lion you will see drinking and then the bird life here is, is certainly uh, a big highlight, even for non-twitchers, the number of bird species that you'll see and the level and knowledge of your guides as well, being able to, to interpret the, the variety of, of bird life. Mwea Lodge, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's um, actually related to Para Lodge up in Murchison Falls. So it's your classic big traditional safari lodge. And like Para, it benef its biggest benefit is its location. Mwea being inside the park, the only lodge inside the park and on the Mwea Peninsula. So it's, it has an enviable position there um, and easy access to your cruises as well. Mazik Valley Lodge, formerly Chambura Game Lodge, has been rebranded. Um, it was purchased uh, and rebranded and then it's located right on the edge of the park that's actually looking into the park and this is a nice mid-level um, four-star property I think there's about eight uh, tents or a little chalet thatched that chalets I should say all with decks overlooking the 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 national park and there's a swimming pool here as well one thing to keep in mind for Mazik as well as for um, 
the Volcanoes property, Chambura Gorge Lodge. Both of them are located near the village. Mazik is a little bit closer, and you can hear village noise, um, especially if there's a if there's a football game going on. I was there when there was the African Cup was going on, and so the Uganda was actually playing the night that I was there last. We went and watched the Uganda game in one of the local shabins, which is quite an experience. But you will likely hear village noise. It's also um, uh, an Islamic. Uh, community, so you will he hear the call to prayer. Um, that's probably the biggest noise that you might hear, especially in the morning, at, you know, the 5 a.m. wake up call. So, setting the right expectations for guests really important there. Um, I love both of these properties, um, and I'm not bothered by being close to the village, but if someone is expecting to be out in the wild in Queen Elizabeth, um, they will not have that feel um, because of the sound of the village nearby. Mwea Lodge by contrast, is in the park, so you don't have the village noise, although it is quite a big complex as well. So as I mentioned, um, Murchison Falls feels a lot more wild to me than, than Queen Elizabeth. Um, Volcanoes Chambura Gorge Lodge is uh, the most upmarket property in the, in the, most upmarket property in, hold on one second. Okay, so I'm on, a, <laughs> I have a visit from my daughter. I'm on a Skype call, kiddo, so I need you to go downstairs. Nobody. I'm actually doing a webinar. Yeah, I need to get the book. All right. Sorry about that. Little uh, unexpected visitor, my four-year-old daughter, coming to take a look. Uh, so, continuing on, Volcanoes, Chambura Gorge Lodge, by far the most upmarket property in Queen Elizabeth National Park, and is a wonderful, wonderful uh, option. A little bit more expensive than either Mazik or Mwea, but, uh, but a great location, a little bit farther from the village, beautiful views over the National Park, and they've just done a full refurb, and uh, it's looking really, really nice. So for your upmarket clients, this is uh, your best option for sure. And very eclectic and unique decor as well. And they have some great community programs in addition. So um, a really nice option. And the Classic uh, has a great relationship with volcanoes and, and good rates as well. So then heading down into the Ashasha region, um, Queen Elizabeth National Park southern sector. Of course, the biggest draw is the, fig, is the lions and the fig trees and you will have a pretty good chance, about 75% chance to see the lions down here with one night. You spend a couple of nights, your chances get even better. Um, I like this part of the park. It does feel a little bit more wild. You know, there's, there aren't any villages nearby, um, and uh, you, uh, you do feel like you're a little bit more out there. Um, the property that we generally recommend, there's not a whole lot um, of options, but the Ashasha Wilderness Camp is fantastic, um, kind of traditional tented eco camp uh, set right on the river in the southern part of the park and it really does have a wild feel to it so um, we generally have guests stay there one night um, two nights up in the north and then one night in Ashasha um, on their way to Bwindi and uh, that works really well three nights total in the park split between the northern part and the Ashasha part in the south Okay, so now we're gonna get down to Bwindi and we're gonna spend some time at the end here of the webinar talking about Bwindi because I think for some that haven't been, um, and even those that have been, Bwindi can be a little bit confusing to understand um, the different regions and the different properties um, that correspond to the regions. So just a few 30,000 foot view of Bwindi. It's home to, it was home to about half the gorilla population, but recently, as I'm sure you've heard, the population in the Virunga volcanoes increased um, in their latest census. So those gorillas over in Rwanda and in the DRC. Um, so currently the, the national parks in, in Uganda are doing a, a census of Bwindi. So hopefully we'll see an increase in Bwindi as well, but we're up to 1,004 gorillas from the latest census, um, up from 880. Um, with the last census in 2010, and Wendy is home to about 400 of those. As I said, they're doing a census right now. The expectation is that that will increase as well, which is all great news. Permits are $600 per trek. As I mentioned earlier, about 
that's less than half the cost of going to Rwanda, which is they've, they're now at $1,500, no surprise to any of you. Um, and you get to spend one hour with the gorillas. And then you have the gorilla habituation experience, which is $1,500, but you get four hours. So actually quite a good value when you consider that you're getting four times the, um, uh, four time, the amount of time with gorillas for uh, just a little bit over double the price of your, of your single hour trek. And obviously it's the same price as, a, as an hour with the gorillas in Rwanda. Culturally, there's the Batua cultural experience, which we'll talk a little bit about as well in the Buhoma region, but also in the Nukaringo in the south as well. Just gonna give you a little bit of geography here. If you're doing a fly-in safari, and you have basically two options where you'll fly into. The morning flights start in Entebbe and stop in Kisoro here in the south. So if you have guests staying at Clouds Lodge here in Nukaringo, which is one of the, it's very high end, probably the most high end lodge in, in Uganda or in, in Bwindi, uh, here in the south, you would fly them into Kisoro or uh, in Rushaga here, which is Gorilla Safari Lodge or Chameleon Hill Lodge. In those cases, you would fly into Kisoro. If they're staying in Buhoma in the north, which is where the Bwindi Lodge is, um, uh, Gorilla Forest Camp and Mahogany Springs, they would fly into Kihihi, which is here just north. So both of these are less than an hour from the, from the, national, from the, from the various regions of Bwindi. So it's not a, not a long drive, um, but just important to be aware of uh, the different um, airstrips, depending on where your guests are staying. Because traveling fear from Buhoma, on the north to Nukaringo in the south is going to take you a good five to seven hours depending on the road conditions because there are um, no roads that go through the park so you have to go around. Tips for, tips for your packs on trekking and this really was applied to both Uganda and Rwanda and just first on that a lot of people ask what's easier harder what's the experience like between Rwanda and Uganda and I think in general um, the, ex the belief is that Rwanda is a little bit of an easier experience, which I, I think is, can generally speaking, be true, but it really does depend upon uh, the gorilla family that you are trekking to go see. There are, there are gorilla families in Rwanda that are going to take you all day to get to, um, and the same thing can apply in Uganda. Um, depending on where and when do you're trekking as well, um, it influences your experience a little bit, but I wouldn't necessarily focus too much on what's better or, or easier. Um, gorilla trekking is, is a challenging experience regardless of where you do it, and guests need to be prepared for that and be in relatively good condition and shape to do it. It can be an all-day experience, and again, it really depends on the family and, and the conditions on the ground. So instead of focusing on, on um, on the specific uh, experience between the two countries or even between the different regions in Wendy, uh, I think guests should be prepared to, to have an all-day experience and, and be um, ready for that uh, in terms of their, their conditioning. They also are going to want to have strong hiking boots um, with good tread and ankle support, and, and you want to break those in as well. So for your guests that are not hikers they may not have hiking boots before this trip, they definitely want to purchase those several months in advance and wear them around the house, even go out and do some hiking or at least walking around their neighborhood to break in those boots before they, uh, they do a gorilla trek. Um, because you can spend, like I said, a full day, depending on where your gorilla family is and the conditions. Gardening gloves um, or some sort of gloves on your hands because you're in the rainforest and you're going to be clutching vines and trees and plants and um, bushes. And um, you really want to have something on your hands. So gardening gloves is actually a, a great option and cheap option. Maybe something you have around the house. And then gaiters on your, um, over your boots and over your lower part of your leg as well are very useful for keeping mud and debris out of, um, out of your boots. You definitely need long sleeves uh, on, on your shirts as well as long pants. You can tuck those pants into your socks um, to, keep out, uh, to keep out the mud and, and debris and what have you, but gators really can do that for you as well. You definitely need a waterproof jacket. Um, it is a rainforest after all. Layers is critical, so it can get hot, it can get cold, it can rain. Um, conditions can change fairly rapidly, so you want to have, your guests definitely need to have lots of uh, layers. You do have a picnic lunch that is provided uh, while you are in the park, and uh, you don't have to bring your own lunch that will be provided. 
um, for your guests, but you do need to bring lots of water. And uh, we do recommend that people bring their own energy snacks, you know, um, power bars and, and the like, uh, just to have some snacks along the way, because again, it can be um, a long day. For photography, important considerations there, given that again, it is a rainforest, even in the dry season, it can rain and it can just be wet in general. You wanna have dry bags for your cameras, um, Ziploc bags also work, but uh, really spending the extra money to get a, a waterproof dry bag is a, is a good call for, for, uh, for those photographers and really for anybody that's gonna be taking photos. No flashes um, and uh, you, you do want to have, like I said, those layers, so the extra clothing. Having a basic first aid kit isn't a bad idea, though of course the trackers and the guides will have that. And uh, a flashlight um, isn't a bad idea as well, just for extra safety. And then um, an important note, and this applies for anybody, even your hardest core trekker that's in the best shape, I would uh, highly recommend that all of your guests hire a porter. It's $20 and it goes directly to that person. Um, and this is a big source of income for local people in Buindi. So for 20 bucks, um, having the extra help is really, even for somebody who is really in shape and good at trekking, having that extra hand to help pull you up um, a steep slope um, or help you down a steep slope is really a nice thing. And again, it, it goes toward the community uh, and makes a big difference. Okay, so we're gonna do um, a little bit of a deep dive into the different regions of Bwindi, starting in Buhoma in the north. Again, you'd be flying in from Kehihi, which is uh, north of the park. Um, or if you're driving, you'd be coming from Queen Elizabeth National Park or Kibali, depending on your uh, itinerary. Buhoma, there are three properties that we recommend there. Um, primarily, that's uh, Bwindi Lodge, the Volcanoes property, Queen, um, uh, Gorilla Safari Camp, which is, I'm sorry, um, Gorilla Forest Camp, which is the sanctuary property. See, even I get confused by the names here. And um, Mahogany Springs. And all of those, um, if your guests are going to be trekking in Bohoma, they would be staying at those three properties um, and their treks would be you know, very close to their, to their lodges. If Bohoma's permits are sold out, which they do, which does happen, especially during peak season, there is a chance that your guests would then need to trek over here in Rahija. Rohingya is about an hour and a half's drive from Buhoma, and currently there aren't any properties in Rohingya that Classic feels comfortable booking. So in that case, your guests would stay in Buhoma and have to drive the hour and a half to begin their trek. Like I said, it's, uh, sometimes it's inevitable um, or unavoidable, I should say, um, based on you know, the lack of permits in Buhoma. Guests who are staying in Buhoma, and the reverse is true, cannot trek in Nukaringo or Rushaga. As I said, that is a five to seven hour trip around the park. There is no road that goes from Bohoma to Nukaringo, even though it appears there might be right here on this map, that's not a road. So they have to drive around the park and that's an all day experience. So the only place where you would trek um, in the north that you wouldn't be staying is in Rohingya. Like I said, and you would stay in Bohoma um, and then drive to Rohingya. Obviously, we're going to default to Bahoma if permits are available, if you're staying in GFC or Bwindi or Mahogany Springs. Here's some photos of the different properties in the north. Mahogany Springs Lodge is a great mid-level option with beautiful views into the National Park. Big airy main lodge. This is actually, the, I think, the presidential or the honeymoon suite, so this is a little bit bigger than most of the of the chalets. I think there are about 10 or 11 um, chalets now, thatched chalets. They all have those nice little decks that look into the forest. Really comfortable property and great rates here. We get good reviews on the food, the experience. Not a luxury over the top property by any means, but a good option for, for mid-level um, uh, guests. And then on the higher end, you have Gorilla Forest Camp, which is a sanctuary property, slightly higher end. It also is tented. So for those folks that wanna have that tented African experience, it's inside the national park and has a really beautiful um, lawn and a boma area for stories uh, of your trek afterwards and, and a nice drink um, sundowner experience as well. Um, oftentimes they'll have performers come from the, the local village as well as in the evening. You can see a gentleman there playing an instrument um, entertaining the guests. And then Bwindi Lodge also recently been refurbished by volcanoes and is looking really really good I think it has eight um, bandas, um, little chalets, and uh, all of the properties, there's a chance that the, you'll see gorillas come through at some point. It's uh, 
it's not exclusive to Gorilla Forest Camp. If you remember a few years ago, that viral video that, that came out um, from uh, GFC where the, the gorilla was playing with one of the guests hair um, along a pathway. That can happen at any property in, in Pujoma and any property in, in Nuka Ringo or Rushaga in the south. So this is a photo actually from Windy Lodge with the gorilla coming through. The Batua Experience is uh, a nonprofit that was started in Buhoma um, to display um, what the Batua's lives were like before they were removed from the park in 1991. Batua, the original inhabitants, human inhabitants of the park, and when the when Wendy became a UNESCO World Heritage Site, they were forced to leave the park. And today, they don't live the same lifestyle that they did you know, uh, several decades ago. So this is an experience that shows you and your guests what their life was like in the past. It is not how they live today, and that's something to keep in mind for guests. This is not uh, for those that think they're going to see Batua living in their you know, forest dwellings like they did previously, they are disappointed of, uh, oftentimes. So again, setting the right expectation. This is a display and a demonstration of what their lives were like in the past. There's also some Batua experiences in the south of the park um, from Nukaringo or Rushaga as well. The one that we generally recommend is in the north, but we can arrange for or Batua experiences in both parts of the park. So speaking of the south, we'll, we'll head down there now. Um, the southern part of the park, you have Nukaringo sector and Rushaga sector. Here's Buhoma up in the north, this is where we were. So we've now come all the way around the park, five to seven hours. If your guests are on a driving safari and they're coming from Queen Elizabeth, it is a, it is a full day to get from Queen Elizabeth all the way around to the southern part of the park. If they are flying, then they would fly into Kisoro in the south. Um, and one of the important distinctions here in the, in the south is that Rushaga is the only place in the park where you can do the gorilla habituation experience, which we'll talk about in a minute. In Nukaringo, Clouds Lodge is, is based there, eight uh, beautiful chalets. What I love about um, Clouds in particular, it is the, you know, the most high-end property in Buindi. Um, wonderful service, great food. Um, a very nice standard of accommodation, but it also has these views. It's located up on a ridgeline and looks out over the Virunga volcanoes, which oftentimes are spectacular at night with a glowing um, uh, red lava that you can see from some of the active volcanoes. So not only does it have that beautiful um, accommodation and that high level of luxury experience, but it also has these spectacular views. And then just uh, located south in Rushaga is Gorilla Safari Lodge. Nice up uh, mid-level, you know, four-star property as well, um, and, a, and a great option on the, on the southern part of the park in that four-star category. If you are trekking in Nukaringo or Rushaga, you may stay in either section. It is only a 45-minute drive at the most between Rushaga and Nukaringo. So if guest star permits are in uh, Nukaringo, but they can't afford to stay at Clouds, they can stay at Gorilla Safari Lodge just 45 minutes away. They do have to do that drive before their trek, but, um, but it's not a problem to do that, and we do that quite often. And the third option, a little bit farther away, but an hour plus away, is Chameleon Hill Lodge, and that's uh, located on a, the spectacular Mutanda Lakes, which also overlook the Virunga Volcanoes. This would probably be the third option, just because it is a little bit farther away, and it's very eclectic and funky. Um, it's owned by a French family, um, and... Uh, as the story goes, the, one of the, the children was actually who designed the lodge. <laughs> it has that kind of fairy tale fantasy feel to it. But it is, um, it's, it's different, but it is very beautiful um, and because of that location and the views um, that, it, that it offers. But it is at least an hour drive to either Nukaringo or Rushaga. So it does add a little bit more time. The Gorilla Habituation Experience. This is something that has become very popular. There's currently only one family available for the habituation experience. It is located in Rushaga, so if guests want to do the habituation experience, they must stay in the south of Bwindi, and that's either at Nukaringo, at Clouds Lodge, at Rushaga, at Gorilla Safari Lodge, or at Chameleon Hill Lodge. There are only eight guests um, for, the, uh, for the one experience per day. Permits are $1,500 per person but you do get to spend four hours with the gorillas. That doesn't include your time to get there and your time to get back. So this is definitely a full day experience with trekking up 
to 7,500 feet, which also goes for the, for the regular gorilla treks. You can be trekking at altitude. So another reason why guests need to have a, a reasonable level of fitness, but especially for the gorilla habituation experience. Uh, and it is also a very wild and can be an adrenaline rush because these are, this family is being habituated currently. So they're oftentimes on the move. They may, there may be mock charges. Um, these gorillas are not as habituated as the families that have, um, you know, been available for trekking for, for many years. They are becoming habituated to humans, hence the name. And um, so your guests need to have a certain level of of adventure um, because it could be uh, it could be quite a exciting experience and again also a much longer experience than if they're just doing a regular hour trek and again the key here it's only available in the Rushaga region so guests that want to do this they need to stay in the southern part of the park any questions on Buindi and all the different regions and sectors and properties don't ever hesitate to give me a call and we can talk through it as well specific to your to your clients all right, we're gonna finish up here just real quickly. I know we're going over an hour here and sorry for droning on, but there's a lot to talk about with Uganda. We're just gonna wrap up with Lake Umburo and Kadepo as other options. For guests that are doing a, a full driving circuit from Entebbe all the way around, down from Kibali, down Queen Elizabeth, Bwindi, they can either fly back from Bwindi um, using the Aerolink flights, which has become more and more common, or they can do a drive back via Lake Umburo. And this is a full 12 hour drive plus back to Entebbe. So guests that wanna do this, they must stop at Lake Umburo. Um, and there's a wonderful lodge there, Mahingo Lodge. It's a good option um, for active safari goers as well. There's a wide variety of activities there from walking, biking, boating, horseback safaris. You can even go on a running safari um, if you really wanna get some, uh, stretch your legs after being on, on safari for a week. Um, and of course, game drives, including night drives, it is one of the best places to see, if not the best place to see leopard in Uganda, the highest concentration of, of leopard in this small little park. There's lots of kopis and, and thick forest as well. So leopards, good leopard country. Um, and it is about a six hour drive from Windy to Lake Mboro, And Mahingo Lodge is, is the property that we, uh, we support there and there. It's a beautiful, Property located up on top of a kopi with views out over the plains and the and the lakes uh, of Lake Mboro National Park below. You can see the infinity pool there with the views. So a stunning property. And then the following drive from Lake Mboro to Entebbe is another about six hours. So it's a good halfway point, a stopping point for those that are driving back to Uganda that have a little bit more time or who want to, as I said, be a little bit more active as well. And then finishing up here in the far north at Kadepo Valley National Park, one of the last truly wild frontiers um, uh, on, saf on the saf safaris uh, in, in anywhere in Africa, located on the border of Kenya and South Sudan. It's Uganda's most remote park. It might be the most remote park in, in Africa, certainly one of them. Uh, abundant wildlife. It's that traditional, like the Serengeti or the Mara, just endless, endless plains. But here you have no people whatsoever, um, but abundant wildlife, lots of uh, predators, um, including cheetah, the only place to see cheetah in Uganda, and uh, some really unique cultural experiences as well. Um, you have the Karamajong people as well as the Ik people up here. So very worthwhile to try to add on Kadepo. The challenge is, is getting there. The drive is really not practical, and Aerolink flies three times a week, and uh, with a minimum of four packs. So you have to try to either have a bigger group that wants to do it or um, just get a little bit lucky and have guests that are uh, already booked into those flights. Accommodations there, a Poka Safari Lodge owned by the same group as Clouds, wonderful luxury safari lodge. You can also do walking in a Poka, so it's one of the two parks you can walk in in Uganda. And it's a very comfortable, uh, very nice upmarket property and just a great way. I would try to finish my safari here if you can make it work is because you're going to completely detach from the world and just have these stunning, stunning views. Really what uh, I think a lot of people think of when they think of African safaris. You would find that in Kadepo. Okay, there's your, your trip, virtual trip around Uganda. I hope this was helpful and interesting. We're going to look at um, some questions here. 
Um, I will send out a follow-up, including a recording of this. So if you missed anything, then uh, you can uh, catch up by, by watching what you missed in the recording. Um, Classic's website is currently being updated, and there's a lot of good information there, classicuganda.com. As I mentioned, Phil is your founder and director. He's also the one that will handle the, uh, the quoting, the booking inquiries. And then Hilda and her team in Entebbe is, um, is here to uh, handle a lot of the logistics after the booking has happened, and they are fantastic, uh, Hilda and Sissy. For Rwanda, Mandy is uh, our um, go-to person for Rwanda inquiries. So I know this is on Uganda, but if you are looking to do Rwanda, Mandy is your gal to, to handle that. And then, as I mentioned, myself, and Sonia, and Gretchen, we are at the Cassini Collection, and there is my email. So let's take a quick look here at any Q&As. Um, as I said, yes, I will send this out to, um, I will send this out to the group. There's a question about whether this will be recorded, and it is being recorded, this whole long webinar. Um, how many days or nights do you recommend at Kabale, Kabale um, National Park for chimps? Um, you really want to have a minimum of two, and that would be, um, you know, your first night is, is your arrival night, so you'll have that, and then you have a full day in the park, whether that's uh, doing a chimp habituation experience or doing two chimp treks, or doing a chimp trek and the Batwa uh, wetland sanctuary, <laughs> or just having one trek and, and relaxing in the afternoon. If you can convince guests to spend another night to do three, then it opens up your options to do some of the other activities, um, longer treks, some of the community activities as well with the Bogoti community. Um, but generally speaking, most guests are spending two nights there. One night is really not practical at all just um, because of logistics. So. Um, Yep, so that is gonna wrap things up. Not too many questions, which uh, hopefully it wasn't because I talked so long. Maybe it's because I answered all of them. Um, we'll, we'll hope for that. So thank you all for taking the time to, uh, to go on this virtual tour around Uganda with me. Any other questions that come to you after um, the webinar, feel free to send me an email. And like I said, I will send a follow-up to this with some additional documents and the recording of the entire webinar. I hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday and uh, hope to see you uh, in your office or better yet uh, in Uganda sometime in the near future. Thanks again. Take care.